Welcome and thank you for joining me at the table. I'm Thomas Dodderwick and I'm on location this week in Billings, Montana, uh, preparing for Cultivating Eucharistic Amazement, our Eucharistic Revival event that's going on starting tomorrow uh, and running all through Saturday. And so tickets are still available. Make sure you get them. Uh, today's topic is the Eucharist. And joining me at the table is Father Leo McDowell, the pastor at St. Patrick's Co-Cathedral here in Billings and a member of the priest council, actually the yes. vice president of the- Vice chair. Vice chair of the priest council for the diocese. Father Leo, thanks for joining me today. Well, thanks for giving me this opportunity this evening. Let's just talk in general about the Eucharist and, and its role in the life of a Catholic because the Eucharist is so um, specific almost to the Catholic faith, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is, you know, and I like to tell people it's the greatest gift that we have. You know, it is God giving himself to us, making himself present in our midst, and giving us opportunity to be one with him, communion. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you know, it's one of those opportunities that oftentimes our Protestant brothers and sisters don't realize what they're missing. Mm -hmm. They have their idea of what it is to go to communion, but it's not Christ, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus with us. And so that's, that's the highlight of this whole thing. Let's talk, you've hit it right on the heart of it, that our Protestant brothers and sisters will go to communion, or what they call communion, but it's not the same as our Eucharist, is it? We have to understand that Jesus truly makes himself present, and what was once bread and wine truly become Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. You know, it may have the same taste as wine. It may feel like wine in our mouth. It may have the same effects of wine if we drink too much of it, you know, if, if there's leftovers at the end of communion. But what it truly is on the inside is different. I uh, sometimes have used a comparison. I'll point to somebody in the parish that I can usually pick on and say, well, look at Fred over there. You know, Fred one time was a little bitty baby and Fred felt different because his skin was smooth. His hair was not as long. He was a lot smaller. So what he looked like has all changed. What we call the accidents have changed. But what he essentially is, he's still the same Fred he is today that he was 20 years ago. Mm. Now the difference is with the Eucharist, it's just the opposite. It still tastes like the same bread. It still tastes like the same wine. It still smells and feels like the same wine. But what it truly is, the essence of it is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Some Protestant denominations believe that Jesus makes himself present in the bread and wine. Others think it's just a remembrance of what Jesus once did and has no real sacramental significance. And so for us, it really does make a difference as to who we are and what we're doing. Where, where did we come up with that? Because a lot of our Protestant brothers and sisters really think, well, and not even just Protestant Catholics, but, or Protestant Christians, um, but even non-Christians think that we're, we're way out there uh, thinking that this little wafer becomes the body of Christ. Where do we get that? Well, you know, a big part of it comes from the sixth chapter of John, where Jesus repeats over and over and over again, I am the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. And the Jews gathered around him kind of like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> Most of them walked away. And he didn't say, no, 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 wait. I'm not, I don't really mean it that way. He re just reiterated, no, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then at the Last Supper, he took bread, he gave thanks and said, take this, this is my body. Take this, this is my blood. And so he makes it very clear that there's something special about what's happening. And when you look back on it, you can see that connection between what he was saying in John and what he said at the Last Supper mm -hmm. and realize that this isn't ordinary. This is God. God can do great things. And this is what he chose to do, mm -hmm. to make himself present for us. Even if we're not present at the time he walked the earth, he is present for us today in the Eucharist. If I find that difficult to believe, not doubting it, just difficult to believe, am I in the wrong? No, the church 
encourage us to give our assent even if we do have questions. You know, the thing is the difference between saying the church is wrong and it can't be right versus I don't know how the church gets here, but I trust the church. I'm going to give my assent to what the church teaches because the 2000 year history of the church has something to stand on. Mm -hmm. And so the church has to have learned something that I can't figure out in my current state. But I trust that God is working through the church. Jesus said, the gates of hell should not prevail against it. Mm -hmm. You know, he told Peter, you are rock. And so we know that Christ is with his church. So Christ will keep us on the straight and narrow, even if we have trouble understanding it. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to struggle with the understanding. It's a different thing to say the church is wrong. In mm -hmm. that case, you're, you're kind of getting outside the bounds. Absolutely. Now, you, you touched on it a little bit. Do we believe that that host uh, actually becomes this? You know, we don't believe it's the same fleshy material that we are made of, but we do believe that Christ makes himself present in a spiritual way in the Eucharist. And then it does become, in a sense, his body, blood, soul, and divinity. When we see Eucharistic miracles that have happened all around the world, we do see that at times the host does take on that appearance of flesh and blood. And tests have revealed that it's like heart muscle. They've, they've had an opportunity to take Eucharistic miracles samples from around the world, and they all come back as heart muscle with the same blood type. Mm -hmm. It's an AB blood type that's very common in the Mediterranean at the time. Yeah. And so it, it would link itself back to Jesus Christ. Why would God, the creator of the universe, uh, in the second person of the Trinity, want to let himself be just a piece of bread? He, he wanted to show his love for us and give himself to us so we could be united with him. Mm -hmm. And when we receive him in communion, we're actually creating an intimate union between us and Christ in the Eucharist. And that intimate unity helps us to prepare for our ultimate destiny, which is life forever in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so as Christ gives us this opportunity to reconnect, so to speak, it gives us that preparation for what is our promise to come. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not merely just a meal or a remembrance, it is an actual reality. Christ is present in our midst. We become one with Christ in a foretaste to what will happen in the end when we are united with Christ as the children of God. And so at Mass, whenever the priest says the words of consecration, is it something that the priest is doing that's making the bread all of a sudden become the body of Christ? Or how does that, how does that come about? You know, it's God working through the priest. The priest is the tool that God uses to make himself present. Mm -hmm. But it's still an action of God. And so, even if the priest is a great sinner, God still works through the priest because it's God creating the action. It's God that's making himself present. Mm -hmm. He uses the priest as a sign to help us understand what's happening. And the, the fancy church language for that is persona Christi. Or, yes. Or uh, something In the person of Christ. Lines. Yep. Uh, the priest not only acts in persona Christi at the moment of consecration, he also acts in persona Christi in the confessional, doesn't he? Correct. You know, that when you go and confess your sins, the priest is the conduit through which God works. You're confessing and the priest hears it, but God is the one that offers absolution. The priest says the words, God is the one that makes it happen. And it's no accident that those two sacraments are when the priest is acting persona Christi, right? Those two sacraments are married so closely. Right. You know, they're, they're both where God makes himself present in our midst and wants to touch our lives to help us grow. He does in some way through confirmation, through baptism, through anointing of the sick. When a couple uh, results sacrament marriage upon each other, God is still there. But in those two, in a special way, he's trying to help us get past, you know, some of our human frailties and really connect and say, OK, God is here. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in baptism, we're so young, we don't realize it. Confirmation is a one-time thing like baptism. It just kind of happens. But when we receive confession, go to confession, confess our sins, we hear the words of absolution. When we go to communion, receive Christ in the Eucharist, you know, it's a recurring 
events in our lives that help remind us on a regular basis, hopefully weekly, and sometimes even more frequently, that this is a miracle that takes place. This is God coming here because he loves us. Are there times, I'm a fully initiated Catholic. Uh, I've had my first communion, I've been baptized, I've, I've, I've been confirmed. Are there times that I shouldn't present myself for communion? If you haven't fasted, it's a prerequisite hour before communion. If you've committed serious sin and you haven't gone to confession, mm -hmm. you should not present yourself for communion. You know, the idea is, is that we should be receive communion worthily. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to bring a sacrilege upon ourselves by receiving Christ when we're not properly prepared. So, you know, the idea is most parishes have, com have confession on Saturday evening or Saturday afternoon. Take advantage of it if you've done something that would keep you from receiving communion. Otherwise, go up and receive a blessing or just stay in the pew. You're not required to go to communion every Sunday. You're required to be at Mass, <laughs> but not required to go to communion. Sure. So if you're not properly prepared, it's okay to say, okay, I'm not going up this week. When, when the church says to an individual that they should not present themselves for communion, whether that is as a Catholic, as you just described, I, I'm not in the state of grace, I've not fasted properly, or just in general, I'm not in, in a, a, a mindset that I should be receiving the Eucharist, or our Protestant brothers and sisters, or non-believers in general. Um, is that an act of exclusion? I, I, I don't want you to have this great thing I've got, and so we're just gonna exclude you from it. You know, I, it's not really an act of exclusion. If we're not properly prepared, you know, I, I think one of the writings of Paul talks about bringing condemnation upon ourselves mm -hmm. if we don't receive Christ worthily. And so we need to be properly prepared. It's an act of charity by trying to prevent them from committing a sacrilege. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like our separated brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, communion says we're in union with. If you don't truly believe all that the church teaches about communion, about the Eucharist, then you're not in union with the church. Mm -hmm. So you should refrain from going to communion. Mm -hmm. You know, if, and if you do believe everything that the church says about it, you should be Catholic and not <laughs> one of our separate brothers and sisters in Christ. Is there historical evidence that what we believe today in 2023 is what the early church believed in the early centuries? You know, yeah, you go back and uh, I think it was uh, Ignatius of Antioch was talking about as he was on his way to Rome to be martyred. You know, he was looking forward to the a whole idea of being ground up by the teeth of the lions like wheat is kind of prepared for the Eucharist. Mm. You know, he wanted to give himself for Christ, to become like the bread of Christ for the world. Mm -hmm. You know, and the church from the very beginning has talked about receiving the Eucharist. And they would have the Lord's Day, they'd celebrate it, and they would send the deacons out to bring the Eucharist to those unable to come for the central gathering around the bishop. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's always been a part of our practice. It's not something that just kind of came in in the Middle Ages. It's something that we've been you know, it's, we, our understanding's grown a little bit sure. over time, but the practice has always been there. As we prepare for this Eucharistic Congress, um, I know you're going to be there uh, tomorrow and Saturday. What is it that you're hoping to see? You know, I, I'm hoping to see a lot of faithful people who grow in their faith. I'm hoping to see afterwards those people continue that excitement and appreciation for what the Eucharist really is to help their communities continue to grow. You know, that it's not something we go and we watch, it's something we go and then like the words at the end of Mass, ite misa est, go you are sent. Mm. That we take what we learned this weekend and we take it back to all the parishes in our diocese, those visiting from outside the diocese, take it back to your parishes and talk about the Eucharist that it's not just some static thing that happens when we go to a conference, but it's something that becomes a part of our lives that we're excited about. And we're not afraid to share that excitement with our parishioners, our fellow parishioners, and, and wherever else we may be. I appreciate you taking time today. Thank you for joining us, and um, I hope you have a great conference. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It's been great to talk to you today, and hopefully we'll see a lot of those watching the video at the conference and get to know some of them who don't already know me. <laughs>